This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Sean O'Toole. Sean O'Toole is a friend. And uh, after a successful technology career in Silicon Valley, Sean purchased and flipped over 150 residential commercial properties, nicely exiting the market before the credit bubble burst. Combining his technology and real estate experience, Sean launched Foreclosure Radar in 2007, well before most realized a foreclosure crisis was coming. The service was quickly recognized as the nation's best foreclosure information source and helped tens of thousands of real estate professionals succeed in a market which was otherwise devastating. Sean's mission to help the little guys succeed in the real estate market continues with the launch of Property Radar. Sean, we welcome you to our show. Well, thank you, Bruce. Great to be here. We've known each other for quite a long time and had some pretty cool experiences. Probably uh, closing in on a decade now. Yeah, at least. One of, uh, one of my favorite days every year that we're not going to get this year is, uh, is a ride in a limo from a hotel to the uh, to the place that we have the event, Nixon Library. And almost every time I'm there with you alone for, you know, a half hour, you say something that I'm going, okay, I never even heard of that. So I'm going to go back to when you were 10 years old, and then we're going to talk about your son, <laughs> your son's gift, because it's kind of significant to me. So when you were 10 years old, you got a special present. And what was that gift? It was an Apple II, early Apple II computer. So it's like 1978, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was a uh, yeah, it was great. Um, I, you know, I wanted one badly. My parents officially bought it for their business, not for me. Um, <laughs> but I had a lot to do with it. Okay, now at 10 years old, I don't know how many 10 year olds were in the mode of I need a I need an advanced computer. That seems to be pretty advanced. <laughs> I was fortunate. I had a friend whose dad had a, a company that built power supplies for uh, for NASA for uh, um, space vehicles, and uh, he built a very successful company and had a computer at home. And my buddy had no interest in the computer at all, but I would go over to his house, and I was just fascinated by it. And, spend every second possible on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Um, so it was more your idea than your parents. You said, yeah, this computer would be really good for your business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, fortunately, uh, um, was able to talk them, them into that. And uh, I think it was mostly probably to, uh, to shut me up. But, uh, but they did have a business and they did have a legitimate need for it. So you know, it was very expensive at the time, and uh, I was very fortunate um, that they happened to be, you know, both my parents were teachers, but they'd started this little side business, and at that particular point in time, um, it was doing pretty well, so. So when you were, when you were in high school, how did you utilize that computer to, um, you know, benefit, I mean, kind of started your career almost in high school? Yeah, so, um, you know, I just, I, took to, there wasn't a lot you could do with a, a computer in the late seventies, right? Like wasn't a lot of software out there. It was really expensive to buy software. It's only a couple of good games or other things for it. And so you quickly turned to programming just because, you know, there was no internet or anything else. You had this thing and you wanted to do something. And, and so I started writing software. And, uh, then one of my dad's friends actually, uh, had a, a firm that did a data entry and they had a pretty expensive mini computer and it only had 10 terminals and that was the maximum they could put on it and they needed to hire more people and they couldn't afford more terminals or couldn't afford a second computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized you could use these relatively inexpensive Apple IIs to do the data entry, store the information locally and then upload it to their mini computer for processing. And um, 
And that turned out to be a huge boon for that company because now they could have these computers that were a couple thousand dollars versus having to make, you know, a hundred plus thousand dollar uh, system upgrade to add more terminals. So, and, how, um, and that really started it. How old were you when you figured that out? I was 13 when I wrote that software for them. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh my gosh. So you're doing startups basically in your early teens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was, uh, it was great. Did you have anybody at school you could talk to about this, or are you just the lone Mohican? You know, that was kind of just on my own, although, you know, my school, high school, was actually one of the first to get a, uh, um, you know, an Apple II lab, and Apple kind of owned the education market at that point. And um, so we did have a lab, and um, they taught a basic programming class, and, uh, you know, by that time, this was a few years later, um, you know, I already knew the Apple so well that I ended up basically just getting co-opted to help <laughs> with <laughs> yeah. the lab and the class. I remember getting pink slipped out of class because, you know, the computer network was down and they needed somebody to fix it. <laughs> so you got a call. That's funny. Um, your son turns 10. Well, that was quite a while ago now. He's he's going to be a freshman in college here just in a couple yeah, of weeks. But that's, okay, so that's a significant, it's going to lead to another question, but when he was 10, you got him a special gift. And by the way, when you mentioned to, him, to me, you know, we talked about when you were 10 and what you got, and you were contemplating what to get him. When you mentioned it, mentioned what you were getting him, I had never heard it about it. And we were in that limo, and you were trying to explain to me so what was it that you, you got him? A 3D printer. So I decided that was kind of like, you know, of right now at this moment, it was the most similar thing to that Apple II back in the late 1970s, right? It's still early. You know, I think most people go, oh, I don't know that 3D printing is really going to be a thing. Just like even when I when I reached college, right? So in the around 86, 85, 86, my college advisor said, Hey, Sean, you need to stop messing around with these microcomputers, right? The futures in mainframes and mini computers and <laughs> COBOL and ADA. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where 3d printing is right now in my opinion. Okay. So Still a little early. How has that impacted your son's life? So, yeah, so I got him uh, this 3D printer off a of Kickstarter when he was 10, and uh, he learned how to do uh, 3D CAD modeling. And um, Okay, don't, ex don't, ex you know, don't, I don't even know what that is. So what is 3D CAD modeling? Yeah, yeah. It's basically, you know, you got to do a drawing of the part you want to create, and then the 3D printer will print it. Okay. So the 3D CAD is, is how you design it. And, um, so he had his first project, I think right around the same time I did 13. Um, we went to, a, we were at this local meeting and, you know, everybody stood up like a meeting of entrepreneurs, everybody stood up and my son at 13 stood up and said, you know, I'm a, an entrepreneur and I'm into 3d printing and I have a 3d printer and I'm trying to figure out what to build. And a guy approached him afterwards and said, Hey, can you, can you build some prototypes for me? And it turned out he had a large uh, ele electrical equipment manufacturing company and they had some um, circuit breaker, I don't remember what it was, thing that they, they needed, uh, you know, modeled. They had all the drawings, but they were all hand-drawn drawings. Right. So he converted it into a CAD model and then printed them uh, prototypes. Um and they actually used some of his drawings for their patent application and other stuff it was really cool. And then he went on um, and actually designed a part for me uh, for my airplane to hold my headset holder. And uh, I sent one of those to a friend. A friend put that online. Lots of people got interested and in, now he's sold thousands and thousands of those and <laughs> makes a good little living as a high school kid uh, selling a, uh, holders for uh, aviation headsets. Unbelievable. And Which he prints in the garage. That's, that's just amazing. Um, he, he's done a TED Talk? 
he did do a TED talk with that was for another invention he did uh, um, quite a while back, and uh, and he's got a pending patent on that one. Uh, we should actually be hearing back pretty soon. What do you think about the future of three D printed houses? Because you know that was one of the things that you said you you went back in history and said there was a significant decline in the cost of building a house, and that was significant. And at one point, yeah. you, you kind of thought 3D print, printing could enter that space and really make it very, very affordable to live in a home. So we're long overdue for technological, you know, uh, leap in housing, right? We're still using this kind of stick frame, gypsum board, siding, um, you know, approach you know, on top of a slab or raised foundation, right? The oil approach there has not really changed much in, you know, well over 100 years. And it was, it was actually, you know, um, it was the Case Schiller or um, Robert Schiller's study that went back into the 1800s. And there was this really interesting dip that when you first look at the chart, everybody thinks it's the depression, Um where housing prices dropped substantially. But it was actually about, you know, 15, 20 years prior to the, the Depression and better aligns with the uh, launch of the uh, Sears catalog and, um, you know, catalog ordered homes um, that came, you know, basically ready to assemble. Right. Um, that dramatically lowered the cost of, uh, of housing. And, um, and, you know, I just think, you know, we haven't seen another event like that. And I think we're long overdue. I think 3D printing is definitely one possibility. I think there's some others, too. You know, there's lots of interesting stuff, you know, with uh, factory built homes, you know, even cross laminated timber that takes junk wood. We've got a lot of problems up here in Tahoe with bark beetles and, right. you know, they damage the wood, but you can reuse that wood in something like cross laminated timber. Um, so, you know, I think there's a number of things, but we're, we're long overdue for sure. And I definitely think 3d printing, uh, could be one of them. If your son was going to be 10 tomorrow, would the gift change? I still think 3d printing is pretty early. You know, I also think with, you know, some of the the trade disruptions we have going on and that kind of thing, right. We're going to have to figure out how to bring manufacturing back. You know, a lot of people think, oh, we're going to bring manufacturing back. We're going to bring manufacturing jobs back. And, you know, that's one possibility, but it's not a really a, actually a very good possibility um, in terms of cost of living, right? So exporting this, these things off to be built where labor is, is cheap has seen us have tremendous um, standard of living increases, you know, TVs get cheaper every year, et cetera. Um, I don't know that that happens if we bring manufacturing back to the U S if it's done the same way. Right. I think that can happen if it's brought back to the U S with automation, but that won't solve the jobs problem. So I think there's a little bit of a kind of some of the things that people are hoping for probably aren't going to turn out the way they expect. It's either going to be, okay, we got, we got those things back and we got the jobs back, but prices are now, you know, way higher and our standard of living is going down or we bring them back and we bring it back with automation and standard of living stays high, costs stay low, but we don't bring back any jobs. I think those are the kind of two likely outcomes there. In another trip in the limo, Uh, You made this comment, may not be word for word, but it's close. One of society's biggest problems is how will we have a society where 40% of the people either don't have a job or don't need to work? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as I look forward and I, you know, I, I really find robotics and artificial intelligence and all of that, you know, really fascinating. Like as I get for as I look forward, right. I think we can, over time, replace most jobs, Yeah. Um, right? And I think that actually should be our goal, is to replace most jobs, right? Um, and 
but that has big implications, right? Like, so where does income come from and why, why do we receive it? I mean, our whole culture, our whole way of life is so centered around work productivity, right? That to go to a future where robots do everything and, you know, we just hang out, uh, which, you know, is, is maybe a little utopian, but I, I don't think it's, you know, I think it will happen someday. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, it's really not a technology problem. It's a cultural problem. Right. So you're saying the capacity is there to pull that off. It's sort of got some repercussions we're not ready to deal with. I think it already is having, I think it's been having repercussions since the sixties, right? When we had the first kind of software come in for payroll was the first big application, right? And as you had payroll done on the computer, you got rid of lots of people that used to do payroll. Um, And there's still lots of people doing payroll, but it takes a lot less manpower than it did, you know, pre, you know, payroll software. And, you know, so that was kind of the first. And then there's been, you know, there's new ones every day right now where things are coming out, but automated things we didn't, you know, previously think could be automated. And that, that trend's going to continue in it. I think it may accelerate. And I, you know, I think we're still struggling with that, um, you know, wage growth basically going flat starting in the late 1960s. Right. And, uh, you know, that has a lot of implications and I don't think, you know, we're ready for it at all. And I think it's going to continue and accelerate. On another trip, we talked about three, um, not 3d printing, um, self-driving cars. And I said, Oh, I can't wait till I'm driving next to a, (laughs) an unmanned car. And what I was saying is that's going to be completely dangerous. And you told me that, it will be a much safer driver than, than I could be. And yeah. can you, ex- yeah, I mean, never distracted. Yeah. But also is Go it, ahead. you explained to me that there was a computer. If you use an analogy that if it played you uh, rock, paper, scissors, a hundred times in a row would win a hundred times because it anticipates what you're about to do. And then you told me that it does that with every decision around it. And that just, is that, was that accurate? It kind of blew my mind thinking that, in other words, even if it got in an accident, it was the best possible outcome given the circumstance. Yeah, I mean, I think that's roughly true, right? Like, so there's... <laughs> well, I'm an amateur. I mean, there's, there's always... <laughs> there's... Uh, the world is complex and everybody wants to, you know, bring it down to a soundbite. But, um, you know, I think there's no question, you know, that rock, paper, scissors thing, what it's basically doing is it, it, it can perceive changes in your hand faster than you can perceive changes, you know, than we can perceive those changes. right? Right. And so it's not really predicting what you're thinking in your head. It's just that it, it can see things so quickly and change so quickly, right? That it it feels like it's predicted what you've thought, right? Okay. Um, but it's not act. It's not actually like reading your mind, right? Just just to be clear. Okay. <laughs> and then you know, on something like self-driving cars, there's a bunch of stuff that's easy, right? You can get to a pretty reliable self-driving car pretty quickly. Like you can take online classes that would allow you to get to the point where you could build that. Right. Okay. Especially if you have some programming skills. So it'd be a little harder for you not being a programmer, but if you were like an average programmer, like you could take online classes and get 95% of the way there. And then it gets much, much harder, right? As you get farther and farther out into what we refer to as the corner cases, right? The unexpected events. Pretty easy for a car to follow lines in the road. But we've all had, or most of us had, at least us, those of us up here in the mountains have had days when it's almost a whiteout and, you know, there's snow covering the road. There are no lines, right? And you're picking up on very subtle clues 
kind of figure out where you are, right? Maybe tire tracks previously in the snow or the way the snow is berming on the edge of the road or things like that. And, you know, to get to the point where, you know, that car is going to be safe in all situations. And, you know, we had that terrible accident in Arizona with the, the person who wasn't well lit crossing the road the algorithm didn't recognize it right and so it's that last little bit to where we really trust it they still have some work to do okay the impact of the cloud um on the ability for artificial intelligence to learn and to share what it learned is that was has that been a significant thing well sure i mean is you can tap more and more information right i think so, so, I mean, one of the, artificial intelligence is kind of a big realm of stuff, right? And I think there's enough different disciplines within it. It's, it's kind of hard to, you know, for those of us with some data science background, right, it's a little hard to talk about it in, at least it's a little hard for me to talk about it in general terms. Um, but Typically, like the things that are where we're seeing the most uh, benefit right now is not really pattern recognition, but it, it's more like where there's some model of data that you can use to then, you know, uh, learn and then solve problems. So, for example, in the vision side of things, right? Uh, if I take a bunch of photos and, and say, this is the type of house that it is, right? This right. is a modern house. This is the Victorian house. This is a whatever. And I feed it enough of those examples that when I give it a, a new image, even though it won't look, that house won't look like any of the others, it, it will be able to say, oh, that's a Victorian, right? And, um, you know, really great uh, results there with like, um, um, spotting various types of cancers and, you know, reading x-rays and, and things along those lines. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, it works really well there where, especially in the real estate industry, I think we see a lot of people <laughs> um, kind of buy into uh, mistakenly buy into artificial intelligence is that, you still do to your point, like you need that internet, you need that data. Um, the data available on a typical property, you know, is pretty fantastic, right? It's my business, public records data, bedrooms, bathrooms, who the owner is, how much debt there is, how much equity is. There's lots of stuff there, right? Right. But when you think about like predicting the value of a home, which, you know, a lot of the I buyers like compass and, and Zillow with their estimate and, and others talk about, right? Like, oh, we can predict the value of that home. If you stop and just think back for a second, how does the computer access, you know, curb appeal? Okay, maybe Google Street, you know, view, right? How about floor plan? Most floor plans aren't online, right? How about views, right? If there aren't photos that show the view or descriptions that talk about the view, because none of that's in public records, it's often missing from listings, right? So mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of data that's missing, and artificial intelligence can't create that data, right? It, it can't know that. Now, if there was enough other samples in the area where it said, okay, most of the homes in this area have a view, therefore this home probably has a view, right? Maybe you get there, but I think a lot of people, you know, we're still not where we need to be um, to solve a lot of problems. So it's it's both amazing and very early. I'm going to circle back around now to your your start as a real estate investor, and maybe it wasn't the start, but when you started buying trustee sales, that's not exactly the place most people start because that's pretty technical. You, you have to get your information correct or you got a problem. So is that where you kind of started being a real estate investor? Yeah, it really was. You know, I actually bought my first house when I was 18. I had enough success with uh, computers early on that uh, got a little earlier uh, 
start than most. That didn't really go that well. (laughs) (laughs) I don't recommend if you're 18 buying a house. It's way way too much responsibility right then. Um, uh, But, um, and then I kind of just did the normal, you know, home ownership thing. Um, My girlfriend and my fiance and I bought a house. Then we got married and we bought another house. We fixed our houses up. But I wouldn't have called myself, you know, we did okay on the houses we fixed up and resold, but I wouldn't have called myself a real estate investor. And after the dot-com crash, I left Silicon Valley and I was like, you know, moved out to my vacation house. I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. Mm -hmm. And a friend introduced me to a guy who was flipping foreclosures and he was still keeping track of his business on the back of Polaroids kept in a shoebox um, <laughs> with dividers for each day of the month. So, okay, it's the third day he'd show up at the auction and pull out his Polaroids for the third and show up at the auction. And he took his notes on the back and he's like, Hey, my, you know, and my friend says, Hey, my buddy's making a lot of money in foreclosures. Well, I need to write software for him so he can put away the Polaroids. Wow. And uh, I went and talked to him and, uh, and I like, and I was like, I have no interest in this, right? Like there's not very many people buying foreclosures. I want to write software for millions of people, not 40 of the 40 thieves as they you know, <laughs> were referred to back in the day, right? Right. And I, I just really had no, no interest. Although, like, I think we all have that interest in like foreclosures, right? And we all heard that they're a great deal in the rest and like, here's a guy who's an expert, you know, I'll go have lunch with him and talk to him. And I kept asking him, you know, like how much, what's your kind of rate of return here? Right. And are you able to fully deploy your capital? Right. Cause let's say you've got a million bucks, right. Just to use a round number and you know, you're buying houses for $200,000. Well, you're not always going to have all of that million dollars deployed. So that other money has to be sitting there ready which means it's not making any money. So if you only have 600 deployed on, for the most part, you got 400,000 sitting idle, that lowers your returns, right? This was the way my mind was thinking. Okay. And he just couldn't answer these questions, right? He's just like, I don't know. I do really well. You know, he drew, <laughs> had a really nice office. He drove a nice car, but he had no idea. <laughs> and he said, he said, why don't you take my last 20 deals and figure it out. I'd be curious to know, right? He was, at this point, he was interested, but he didn't have time. He was busy. I wasn't working, so I took his, all his stuff home, built a spreadsheet, and, you know, put in all the expenses and all the rest, analyzed all his deals. And he had an 80% return on capital, wow. including the money that was sitting idle. Wow. And I went, Oh boy. You know, <laughs> I had a couple of decent little exits in Silicon Valley. You know, I wasn't, you know, retire uh, for life rich, but I, you know, I had some money and I was like, okay, if I put my money and made that kind of return, unless I happen to hit a, a Google or a total home run in Silicon Valley, I'm going to make more money doing this than I am going to be going back to Silicon Valley. And I can do it from my vacation home, right? which is where I want to live, not Silicon Valley. So I said, okay, I'm going to give this a try. And uh, ended up flipping 150, almost 160 properties. And, uh, but I only managed a 55% return on capital. So it didn't do nearly as well. That's just terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> wow. Okay. But in the meantime, you did... You did something else. Now, about 2000 and was it six? You said, okay, looks like I'm, I'm going to be done as a, a buyer. What was, what was going on there that you said, it looks like uh, I'm concerned and I'm, I'm going to leave the, leave the business. Yeah. I wish I'd known you then. I came to that conclusion at my, on my own at the end of 2005 and my partner's you know, that I'd had and, and others were like, you're a moron, right? This is the best <laughs> real estate market ever. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> um, you got to stay in. And I was just convinced, you know, and there was a, there were some signs that convinced me, you know, I sold a $450,000 house in Stockton to 
a hotel maid and <laughs> a uh, field worker. Yeah. And like they could barely afford it on the pay option payment. And I'm like, wait a second, this pay option payment, you know, isn't going to stay this low. It's going to go up. Yeah. And, you know, I actually called my agent, I actually even talked to their agent and they're like, it's fine. Like, well, what do you care? You're selling the house. And I'm like, oh, this isn't okay. Yeah. And it really bothered me. Yeah. Um, so I just decided I was done. I felt like there was a, that this wasn't sustainable and it was going to blow up and I didn't want to be on the wrong side of that. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.